हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू लेक्चर 29 ऑफ दिस कोर्स लास्ट टाइम आई स्टार्टेड डिस्कसिंग अबाउट फ्लोरसेंस माइक्रोस्कोपी आई विल कंटिन्यू विद दैट एंड शो यू सम मोर एप्लीकेशंस फ्लोरसेंस माइक्रोस्कोपी हैज सेवरल एडवांटेजेस As we know that fluorophores are self-luminous, so they exhibit very high contrast. They are also very sensitive. You only require a small concentration for successful labeling of the different components. They are very specific, and so they can discriminate between individual proteins. They can discriminate between organelles. and they can discriminate between component of cells very well another advantage with fluorophores are that they can be tolerated by living cells in low concentrations fluorophore can be used in several ways to mark on target tissues cells and cell organelles and so if you want to look at cell and its component fluorescent microscopy is very useful so fluorophore can be used in several ways to mark on target tissues cells and cell organelles and that's why fluorescent spectroscopy is quite often used to look at cell and cell organelles fluorophore can also be linked to enzyme substrates or incorporated into fluid tracers or applied to tissues as stains they can be produced endogeneously within the cell as fluorescent protein and they can lend themselves to tracking protein diffusion kinetics and also for measuring interaction with other molecules so there are several different applications of fluorescent spectroscopy and i will show you some examples to you so some cell tissues so auto fluorescence and that's how you can differentiate between two of those such tissues so many mammalian tissues contain endogenous substances such as lipo fusin in retina that auto fluoresces and there are uh, few tissues which induce auto fluorescence on treatment with aldehyde based fixatives and thus you can look at those tissues and see what is happening to that tissue this is a uh, image which shows you auto fluorescence of pollen grain so this has been taken from fluorescence microscopy and you can see that you can see auto fluorescence of pollen grains lipofuscin of retina also has auto fluorescence as i told you and that can be seen from this fluorescence microscopy image and you can see everything is quite clear here so dark lines can be seen so just from auto fluorescence you can see the different tissues some of the tissues can be seen with auto fluorescence but some of the applications need the use of what is known as green fluorescent proteins so let me discuss first green fluorescent proteins and then i will discuss how they can be used for various applications green fluorescent protein is a protein which has 238 amino acid residues and they exhibit bright green fluorescence when exposed to light in blue to ultraviolet range 
and its emission peak is at 509 nanometer which is in the lower green portion of the visible spectrum and that's why they looks like green and you can see the green fluorescent protein picture taken from two different angles. Although many proteins have tryptophan as their component which can fluoresce and have high quantum yield, but they do not emit the fluorescence quite enough to see through naked eyes. So, what makes GFP green fluorescent protein special is the auto cyclization of these three residues serine 65, tyrosine 66 and glycine 67. So, GFP has this tri amino sequence which undergoes auto cyclization in presence of light and that makes it fluoresce more. So, what happens basically is you can see that serine 65, tyrosine 66 and glycine 67 it undergoes cyclization to form imidazolinone ring system and it undergoes dehydration to give you cyclized ring system cyclized ring system which on oxidation which on oxidation gives you green fluorescence and this is known as mature GFP chromophore. So, the fluorescence in GFP arrive after multiple process which consumes oxygen and generates H2O2 and this results into tightly worn triplet ring fluorophore which shows fluorescence. And this is the final structure of your fluorophore, cyclized fluorophore. It has series of conjugated double bonds and you can see that this is conjugated to this double bond and this is conjugated to this double bond. And so, there is a series of conjugation and that is why it fluoresce. The fluorophore is active when the phenol group gets deprotonated. So, if it gets deprotonated then there is a conjugation and then it gets active, it gets active. Here are some more fluorophores which is protein based and their structures are given. This is the blue fluorescence protein, it is known as EBFP and this is cyan and this is known as ECFP. So, cyan fluorescence protein, this is blue fluorescence protein and then you have a red color, this is known as DS red and this is yellow fluorescence protein which has yellow color and this has somewhat different colors, this is glycine 67 histidine 66, serine 65. If you see here theonine 65, glycine 67 and tryptophan 66 gives you CFP, glutamine 66, tyrosine 67 and glycine 68 gives you DS rate and glycine 65, tyrosine 66 and glycine 67 gives you YFP. So, these are the fluorescent proteins which are endogenously expressed as a fusion protein and then you can track the different proteins or nuclei using this. So, these are the few fluorophores which are quite often used, DAPI which I discussed last time, it emit at 460 nanometer, GFP green fluorescent protein it emits at 500 nanometer, FITC it emits at around 520 nanometer, Psi 3 or Alexa 568 it emits at 580 nanometer and Psi 5 it is emitted at 660 nanometer. So, this is 
they absorb at one wavelength and emit light at a specific and longer wavelength. So, you can see that this side if you go this is a lower wavelength. So, they are absorbing at lower wavelength and emitting at high wavelength and that is known as stock shift that we have already discussed. Now, there are several applications which I discussed with you last time, but I will also show you more applications of fluorescence microscopy. We can use fluorescence microscopy for animal cell visualization. Here is one animal cell micrograph. You see this is your Golgi apparatus, this is nucleus and then microfilament network they can be stained with the different dyes and you can see it clearly in a cell. You can see it clearly in an animal cell and that is what is the beauty of fluorescence microscopy. You can see clearly all these organelles inside an animal cell. Now, this is another image taken from fluorescence spectroscopy and in this mitochondrial network was found in ovarian tissue from mountain goat. So, this all red one is mitochondrial network and this is the blue one is nucleus. So, you can clearly see how mitochondrial network is there in an ovarian tissue from mountain goat. We already, I already discussed about autofluorescence. Autofluorescence can be characteristic for a certain tissue and therefore, can be used for tumor detection also. Not only we can look at the different, different parts of a cell we can also see morphology of cell lines and here is one example given. This is an example of undifferentiated cells. So, you can see how does it look like in a fluorescence microscope and now when you take a differentiated cells how will this look like. So, you can differentiate between different types of cell or different cells in different conditions, cells in different status. So, one example here is given of undifferentiated cells and this is given for differentiated cells. There is remarkable difference between the images of two different cells. This is another example where we looked at where researchers looked at differentiation of a cell line C2, C12 in culture and that you can see the initial picture is like this and then differentiated cells looks like this, differentiated cells looks like this. We can also image the phenomena of apoptosis using imaging, fluorescence imaging. Here is the example where 1 into 10 power, power 5 HeLa cells were treated with 1 micromolar of apoptosis inducing agent staurosporine and you can see this is without staurosporine at 0 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, 270 minutes and you can see there is very little difference. But when you add this reagent, which is basically apoptosis inducing agent, this is at 0 minute and then 60 minute, 120 minute, 270 minute. So, you can see there is a vast difference when you go from 0 minute to 270 minute. You can see all these spots, bright spots quite clearly in apoptotic cells and their color is also changing, their color is also changing. So, not only 
So, microscopy, fluorescence microscopy can not only be used to look at the organelles of different cells, we can also see the status of cells. Fluorescence microscopy can also be used to study interaction between two species and for this we use the special technique of fluorescence, FRET and FLIM. I have already discussed FRET and FLIM, but let me again give you a brief overview. So, when a donor which is a fluorophore is excited, it will emit acceptor if it is at a long distance, it does not get affected, but if donor and acceptor are near to each other, then if you excite donor, then acceptor will also emit, acceptor will also emit and the effect of freight will be that donor lifetime will be shortened, acceptor emission will depolarize, donor fluorescence will be quenched and acceptor fluorescence enhanced on donor excitation. So, donor fluorescence will get quenched, acceptor fluorescence will enhance, donor lifetime will be small and acceptor emission will be depolarized. So, measuring the distance basically using FRET can be done by using the fact that donor lifetime shorten when donor and acceptor are near to each other and that is utilized by fluorescence lifetime imaging flim to look at the distance between donor and acceptor. FRET can also lead to acceptor emission depolarization and that can be measured by fluorescence polarization microscopy fluorescence polarization microscopy and again that can be used to gain information about the distance between donor and acceptor. Donor fluorescence quenched, acceptor fluorescence enhanced on donor excitation. So, again we can capture the, okay, so uh, let us again talk about this donor fluorescence quenched, acceptor fluorescence enhanced on donor excitation and so we can measure donor recovery after acceptor photo bleaching and that can also tell you about the distance. The last one is based on the fact that freight leads to donor fluorescence quenched, acceptor fluorescence enhanced on donor excitation and so we can measure quantitative measurement of acceptor enhancement on donor excitation. It is easy, but crosstalk need to be corrected for. So, we can either use lifetime, we can use polarization and we can use fluorescence quenching of donor of fluorescence uh, increase of the acceptor to look at the distance between donor and acceptor. But for that we need to a very good pair of acceptor and donor and generally good freight pair is CFP, YFP. So, one is used as a donor, another is used as a acceptor. GFP and M cherry is also used as freight pair. Fluorescein rhodamine is used as freight pairs, Psi 3, Psi 5 is used as a freight pair and there are other molecules which has been used as a freight pair, but these four are example of very good freight pairs. Now, there are two different kind of freight experiments, one talks about the intramolecular distance another talks about intermolecular distance. For example, if you are trying to look at the folding process, then you need to do this kind of experiment. In that what you do is you tag 
one part of the protein with CFP, another part of the protein with the YFP. And if protein folds, this YFP and CFP will come close to each other. If it is unfolded, then if you excite CFP, emission will only come from CFP, YFP will not be affected. Whereas, if protein is folded, then if you excite CFP, YFP will get affected and it will emit light. So, here CFP is acting as a donor and YFP is acting as acceptor. So, if they are close e to each other, then there will be FRET and YFP will show emission. The second experiment is intermolecular experiment which is generally used to look at the interaction between two protein molecules or two molecules. So, these are the two molecules X and Y, one is labeled with YFP and another is labeled with CFP when they are apart, if I excite CFP it will emit. Now, if I put them together and if there is an interaction, it means the distance between CFP and YFP will be small enough to have good freight and so when you excite CFP, your emission will happen from YFP. So, freight is generally utilized in three different ways. One is by using it as an intermolecular freight probe. The scheme one is given here where we are trying to look at interaction between two different molecules. One molecule which is called sensor is tagged with CFP protein and another which is known as detector is tagged with YFP. What we are going to do is we are going to excite CFP and we are going to detect the effect of freight on YFP, YFP. If they are far apart, we will not see emission from YFP, but if they are near, then we can see the emission from the YFP, emission from the YFP. And that is how we can look at the interaction between two different partners two different partners. The second probe is to look at intramolecular interaction and in that case we will use the freight pair on same protein. One end will be tagged with CFP and another end will be tagged with YFP. The part where CFP is tagged is called sensor and this part is known as detector. What we need to again do is we excite CFP and we look at the effect of effect of exciting CFP on YFP. So, if suppose protein or any molecule in a conformation where this two parts are far apart, then there will be no fit and you will not see emission from YFP. But when they are close together, which generally happens when protein gets folded or a molecule goes into a compact conformation, in that case there will be fret and YFP will show emission. There is a third case in which sensor is not tagged. This molecule is tagged at one part by YFP and another part by CFP. When it is not in complex form, it shows freight, but when sensor comes and sit on this this uh, seat on this detector, 
the YFP and CFP goes far away and what happens is that when you excite CFP, YFP will not show fluorescence, YFP will not show fluorescence. One of the example of using FRET for your signaling process is shown in this example where FRET pair is used to look at phosphorylation of CRK protein by ABL. What is done is the CRK2 protein was sandwiched with cyan and yellow emitting variant of green fluorescence protein. So one end you put YFP and another you put CFP. This is when, this is the structure when, this is the structure when this ABL is not present. If ABL is present, then what will happen? that interaction will take place, phosphorylation happens and then interaction will take place and then the, the, this distance will decrease, this distance will decrease and this distance will decrease and there will be a fret. So if you excite CFP, then YFP will show emission. YFP will show emission. So this is your when ABL is not present and this is when ABL is present. Now as a control to see that whether this effect is due to coming of coming together of YFP and CFP, the scientists also looked at what is the effect of CRK protein by proteinase K. So what happens that if you put proteinase K into this CRK2 sandwiched with this uh, sandwiched with YFP and CFP, it will cut the two parts. It will cut two parts and also YFP and CFP will come out. In that case, the distance between YFP and CFP is going to be high and so you expect FRET to be less, FRET to be less and what does that mean is YFP should not show emission, YFP should not show emission and that is what you are looking at this thing. If protein is alone, protein is alone. So this is your fluorescence intensity. When it is, uh, when the spectra is taken in presence of ABL, phosphorylation happens. Now protein comes into conformation in which YFP and CFP are close. In that case, your fluorescence increases. But when you cut by protein HK, it goes far apart and so fluorescence intensity decreases. So this is a very good example to look at the interaction between two parts or looking at the effect of, for example, phosphorylation on the conformation of CRK protein. So, YFP and CFP pair can be used to look at the interaction between two proteins. We can also monitor molecular movement by fluorescence microscopy. General idea is optically mark one region of the cell and follow where it goes at later time. The way we implement it is we can do FRAP we can use flip and we can use photo bleaching. We can also make use of photo activation. So these are the few techniques which can be used to look at the molecular movement by microscopy. Now let us understand the difference between FRAP 
flip and eye frap. These are the three different photo bleaching and photo activation technique. So now look at the first case is of frap. What you do? You have a molecular molecule stained with a dye, and now you take a resin, and then you bleach it with high intensity light. Now you leave it. What will happen? It will totally bleach when first time it is bleached, and now slowly it will recover, 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 and that's what you are looking at. So initially, we will see this green, then I put the photons, this will be deep and then again fluorescence intensity is coming, coming back. So this is one of the technique and that is known as FRAP. The second technique is FLIP in which what you do is that you bleach the part which you are not observing. Here you have bleached the part which you are observing. Here you bleach the part which you are not observing. So for example here and then what will happen that this bleaching will slowly go to the part which you are looking at uh, which is which is not bleached. So you see this green is now decreasing. So effect of bleaching on other part is now seen on the part which is not bleached and that is a flip. So you can see it is a decrease. Now the third is your what is known as photo activation technique and in this what you are doing is that you are you have unstained molecule, unstained tissue and now what you did is you dye a particular area and what you do is you now put the light. What will happen? It will slowly lose its thing and in turn it will the it will this send the color of dye to every area and now you can see that initially this and then slowly it is decreasing slowly it is decreasing so initial this is like you have dyed and then there is a transfer of the dye from this uh, from this area to other part. Now these three techniques can be used to look at these three techniques can be used to look at the movement and I will show you one example. Here in this picture what has been shown is how does Fox A1 moves in nuclei in comparison to other transcription factor for example C mice. So this is also Fox A1 is also a transcription factor and what you are trying to look at how does it move in nuclei. So now look at this here what has been done that the movement of C mice has been seen after photo bleaching. So you can see that this part, this is the pre-treatment and at 0 second you bleach this part and now you see slowly, slowly your there is a recovery of the recovery of the color, recovery of the color. Now same thing is done with Fox A1. This half part is blessed at 0 minute and now 20 second, 40 second, 1 minute, 1.5, 2, 3 minutes, 4 minutes, 5 minutes. You can see that in this we started looking at the 
recovered color at 20 second whereas till 4 minute you are not seeing anything for fox a1 what does that mean is that fox a1 moves much more slowly in nuclei than transcription factors such as c mice now you can also look at the relative fluorescence and this is the way it is increasing the way it is increasing and here you can see the increase is very slow increase is very slow so for fox a1 increase is very slow whereas c mice increase is very fast what does that mean is fox a1 moves much more slowly in nuclei than c mice so this tells you that there is a faster movement of c mice compared to the fox a1 which is undergoing slow movement so this is one example several of such examples are present in the literature so this flip of frap is generally used to look at the movement so all these things frap and flip can be used to look at the movement in a cell there are several other examples people have used fret approach to a study cell signaling cellular ion levels enzyme activities and cell mechanics or mechanotransduction these are the few references which is present you can go and look at it direct assessment of protein dynamics is enabled by gfp the photo activation techniques has been adopted to look at protein fusion histones microtubuli cell signaling component and cell adhesion proteins flip analysis has revealed that movement of messenger rnas is restricted within myofibers of drosophila body walls muscle cells similarly capability of frap assays has been demonstrated by a study showing that membrane protein dynamics differ in the anterior and posterior parts of drosophila embryo so there are several different kind of application using flip and frap is available in literature and one of the major use of these two techniques are to look at the movement now microscopy can also be utilized as a sensor and we already know that fluorescence lifetime gets affected by environmental factors like pH, polarity, temperature, ion concentration. And what does that mean is pH, ion concentration or temperature is going to affect your images and that is why they can be used as a parameter for biological sensing biological sensing gold particle coated with protein a are used to detect antibody bound to protein antibody bound to protein so what you do is you take a gold particle which is coated with protein a and when you put into the cell it will go to bind antibody and that's how you can detect the antibody bound to protein fluorophores can be used to look at the ion concentration this is your the protein which has been used as a fluorophore for this is known as fluorescent protein based activity integrator and the name is calcium mpari so what it does is that this protein has a structure like this if i excite it at 400 nanometer there will be no photo conversion but if i put calcium and when it goes to hollow form it means calcium bond form when you excite this calcium bond form at 400 nanometer there will be photo conversion to red fluorescent form so if there is a calcium then it will give you red color if there is no calcium then it will not give red color so just by looking at the red color 
or intensity at the lambda max corresponding to red color you can know what is the amount of calcium 2 plus in the solution. There are other kind of sensing which can be done using fluorescence microscopy. There is one example here given that is biosensing of caspase activity and translocation to nucleus. In this you can see here this is your here there is R A and B these are the two molecules and there is a G A. If I take caspase 3 and here is your substrate if we take caspase 3 and put it what this caspase 3 does it will cut the substrate and there will be translocation of this B from cytoplasm to nucleus. So, this part is nucleus, this part is cytoplasm. So, it is going from cytoplasm to nucleus and when it goes to cytoplasm to nucleus then it fluoresce to green color, then it fluoresce to green color and that is what you can see it here. 90 minute, 91 minute, 91.5, 92, 93. So, you can see that color is changing or this green one is becoming more prominent, green one is becoming more prominent. So, if caspase is not active then it will not cut and you will not see this kind of image. We can also look at co-localization. One of the example I have discussed in the um, earlier lecture previous lecture. So, co-localization here you see E CFP mitochondria. So, mitochondria tagged with CFP this is nucleus plus cyto uh, nucleus plus cytosol uh, is tagged with YFP and when you merge it will be like this and Pearson factor is 0.82 ECF with mitochondria R, this is the MERS thing and what you get is Pearson factor 0.76 and co-localization is 11 percent and this here co-localization is 34 percent. So, there are way to calculate the co-localization from the MERS picture, MERS picture and the image to find the percentage of localization factor. I am not going into detail, but if you want you can go and look at some of the book I have referred to. We can also look at the transmission of virus using fluorescence microscopy and this is one of the example where transmission forms of malaria parasite called gametocytes which is green here has been seen inside human red blood cells, human red blood cells. So, this image was obtained using confocal fluorescence microscope. Gametocytes were detected by GFP fluorescence and the red blood cells are stained using lipophilic membrane dye, lipophilic membrane dye. And now you can see here that you know you can look at the gametocytes of the malaria parasites how it has gone inside human red blood cells. We can also know internalization of the different bacteria or different molecules inside the cell. For example, in this case what you are going to see is amoeba internalize human cell fragments preceding human cell death. Now, you can see here phage this is A H. Now, you can see this if you merge it, it will be like this 28 minute. Now, you see here there is a leak internalization here you can see internalization here it, you can see internalization and that can be seen is it in a much better way using some other dyes, some other dyes. And so, fluorescence microscopy can also be used to look at internalization of 
bacteria or virus inside a cell fragment. Here is another way to look at the internalization. For example, during phagocytosis, if you take this dilabeled bacteria, this is the attached bacteria and the particles. Outside cell, it is pH 7.4, it will not fluoresce. If we go inside the cell and if it goes in the phagosome where the pH is 5, it will start showing fluorescence, it will start showing fluorescence. So, you can look at the internalization using fluorescence spectroscopy. Similarly, this dye level dextran and other particles is here and if they go to early endosome, they will change color like this, early endosome, their color is this and late endosome, you can see it is quite intense red, quite intense red. So, by using pH sensitive dyes, by using pH sensitive dyes, you can look at the internalization, internalization of bacteria inside the cell. We can also look at the movement. I have discussed few of the example, but I am now going to show you a picture in which fluorescent microscopy is used to look at the mitosis in epithelial cells. Mitosis in epithelial cells. Now let's, let's look at this. Now you can see the picture. Let's see it again. How beautiful it is. So, you can see how important fluorescence spectroscopy is in looking at the various event inside our cell, inside our body. So, it has many more applications. I have tried to show you some of the applications. I hope that will give you a flavor of how fluorescence microscopy can be used, how fluorescence microscopy can be used. So, thank you very much. See you in the next lecture. Bye.